good evening everyone uh, i have been given this daunting task to explain the vestibular system and i'll try to do as much justice as i can uh, so the vestibular system uh, helps to maintain the spatial orientation and stabilize the vision especially during the purpose of uh, during movement for the purpose of maintaining balance as you can see in this gymnast particularly able to maintain balance when she is not receiving any inputs from either the proprioception or the visual system it uh, primarily developed because there was a need to detect uh, gravity so therefore it is not only present in plants it is also present in aquatic animals also fish and aquatic animals we know they all swim in such a way that the their relationship with gravity is maintained and this relationship is extremely important for us to maintain our balance and the vestibular system helps us to maintain this balance with the gravity and perceive the horizon as horizontal and as you can see here he is able to balance even though he is on two wheeler because his head is oriented in line with the gravitational force and the moment this is disturbed there this relationship is altered there is a lack of balance and it when the system malfunctions therefore it can cause symptoms like vertigo or disequilibrium the contents of today's lecture will be divided into a basic functional anatomy from there on we shall go on to discuss how the hair cell works and how it works in the macula and how it works in the crystal the vestibular end organs are located in the inner ear and they act as mechanoelectrical transducers that is any movement is perceived and that is converted into electrical impulses so as to give us our orientation so these signals are then relayed into the cranial nervous system which then uses it to stabilize gaze or posture through various reflexes notably the vestibular ocular reflex and the vestibular colic reflex the inner ear the inner ear as you can see is located deep inside the temporal bone and it consists of two main parts the bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth the bony labyrinth is a series of interconnected cavities and canal filled with a fluid called perilymph within it the membranous labyrinth is housed so we can say that the membranous labyrinth is like an inner tube of a tire and it is anchored to the uh, bony labyrinth by various trabeculae which contain blood vessels so within it the the membranous labyrinth within this is the membranous labyrinth which is housed which is housed and this membranous labyrinth consists of a system of sacs and ducts filled with a different fluid called endolymph this endolymph is rich in potassium the membranous labyrinth has got three parts the first is the auditory part which is a snail shaped cavity called cochlea which contains the organ of corti which is the sensory receptor for hearing the part responsible for maintaining balance and visual focus on a single object includes the vestibular part and the semicircular part the vestibular part contains the saccule and utricle which help to maintain balance while stationary or static balance and semi three semicircular canals that are responsible for maintaining balance during movement or dynamic equilibrium in broad so to speak broadly this bony uh, labyrinth forms a this bony labyrinth as you can see it forms a tube within a tube uh, configuration the mri studies have revealed that the total volume of bony labyrinth is 192.5 mm cube and endolymph is 
34 millimeter cube and perilymph is 158 millimeter cube so this means that the ratio of perilymph to endolymph is roughly here endolymph is 1 and perilymph is 5 times so endolymph to perilymph is 1 is to 5 buckingham and wells valvasori further found in a pliant mold of endo inner ear it can easily fit into a 3 ml the uh, syringe so this is actually the true picture of i in a rear the labyrinth as you can see here these are the trabeculae and they contain the blood vessels which supply the nourishment to the endolymph and therefore it is a very important point because while the bony labyrinth the perilymph filled area is hindered by these trabeculae the fluid can flow freely without any hindrance in the endolymph it allows easy passage so that the fluid to, uh, to the so fluid dynamics can respond very easily to the head motion researchers also injected dye alchen blue dye in the semicircular ducts and they found that the duct got arrested on either side of the cupola and this is very important implication so anything which is here will not be able to go there because this cupola it forms a complete diaphragm and this is important particularly in cases of bppv where otoconia have to be therefore repositioned into the uh, utricle and they cannot simply go from here to the utricle because the cupola is forming a complete diaphragm <coughs> so as i've already said the endo uh, membranous labyrinth is filled with a potassium rich endolymph which is secreted by the stria vascularis present in cochlea and then through the ductus reunions it uh, enters into the vestibular part and from there it is absorbed by the endolymphatic cells and the dark cells in crystal and maculae though some authors believe that these dark cells are also responsible for producing the endolymph the frequency even though they are filled with the same fluid the frequency to which the cochlea responds is different to that what the vestibular system responds the cochlea responds to frequencies of 20 to 20 kilohertz so 20 to 20000 hertz whereas for the vestibular system it is below 10 hertz but maximum usually up to 25 hertz the normal head movements can happen even as low as 3 to 2 to 3 hertz and the body has to respond to these stimuli in very few milliseconds at five discrete locations we can see that the lining epithelium is specialized into sensory neuroepithelium and this contains hair cells and end of these nerve fibers these vestibular receptor cells are known as hair cells they are called hair cells because the stereocilia they look like hairs but there are different between the hair cells in sound found in the vestibular system versus the cochlea the vestibular hair cell here you can see is a rob this is actually a frog hair cell uh, which was uh, an electron microscopy done by researchers in harvard but here you can see that the vestibular hair cell is a robust bundle of hair cell and that there is a structure tall structure single tall structure which is known as the kinocilium and there is gradual increasing you have some short and some tall stereocilia but there is one only one single tallest kinocilium is present the vestibular uh, uh, this kinocilium is present in vestibular hair cells but in the cochlea hair cells this uh, kinocilium is not present and hair cells are uh, present as 2 to 3 rows of stereocilia and which is actually a very good thing actually developmentally 
uh, it is believed that this was always present but in cochlea they all degenerate to form a single hair cell because cochlea we need much faster responses and a single length will a, a taller length and a different length will probably hinder these responses so each vestibular hair cell has got 40 to 200 stereocilia with only one kinocilium at the apex the arrangement is such that the stereocilia which is near the kinocilium is longer versus compared to the one which is the furthest and that is how this influences the response to movement which we will learn later on so hair cells are mechanoelectrical transducers and they are of two types type they are of two types type 1 and type 2 hair cells the type 1 hair cells are flask shaped hair cell and they are bottom heavy while type 2 hair cells are cylindrical in shape these type 1 hair cells these are exclusively present in the vestibular uh, system of land animals and uh, they are uh, innervated by these calicial endings which are very broad and almost cover most of the uh, most of the body and this uh, and this calicial ending from a single thick axon as you can see the dendrite is very thick now these are responsible for what is known as a phasic response. Phasic response you means suppose you consider a weight lifter and he is lifting a very heavy weight. If he is lifting a very heavy weight, the lots of muscles will fiber and uh, will fire. And when one particular muscle will fiber, he will be able to lift the weight so the uh, this is known as signaling timing so that when we need to lift the weight so when we evolved into land animals we needed to respond to sudden jerky movements for whatever reason and they became a part of our life so we needed immediately the balance system to act and that is done by these thick axon fibers by type 1 hair cells type 2 hair cells or cylindrical hair cells are present in the cochlea as well as lateral lines and the vestibular entire vestibular system they are innervated by thinner dendrites and this is like a button as you can see and they are innervated by multiple axons but here you can see it is innervated by afferent dendrite and here it is efferent one. Okay. So it has a tonic response. What is a tonic response? You consider a resistant band which helps us to maintain a particular impulse. So like a stretch, it helps us to maintain a particular impulse and this helps to maintain the general state of a system. So in constant velocity, particularly in constant velocity and it constantly gives a feedback to the body what is going on. Along with this, we have these support cells which form very tight junctions between uh, the various cells and they prevent mixing of this endolymph with the perilymph. So, thereby maintaining a electrochemical gradient of potassium. So, hair cells, they work by detecting movement of the hair bundle. When the hair bundle move towards the kinocilium, which is the preferred direction, this is our preferred direction. So, there is excitation and when mm. it, uh, uh, so that causes depolarization and release of neurotransmitters when it moves in the non-preferred direction that is away from the kinocilium then it produces um, hyperpolarization or inhibition releases less less neurotransmitters if there is an orthogonal uh, direction then 
it will produce no response. And these uh, bundles of uh, hair cells, these bundles of hair cells are arranged in different manners in the entire um, vestibular system so that every action, every uh, all the vectors are stimulating different sets of hair cells and that is then generating the response and telling us about the directionality of the movement. So, this way the hair cells can signal the brain about the direction as well as the speed of the movement. The purpose of this orientation is to align head accelerations so that they produce all the forces in an aligned way and they can act on the hair cells in a same way. The resting membrane potential of the hair cell is minus 40 to minus 60 millivolts and all the responses are skewed in such a way to facilitate excitatory over inhibitory response. Only a 3 degree of displacement of the cilia in the plane of excitation will produce maximum response. These kinocilium they extend into the overlying gelatinous matrix and the movement causes the generation of electrical impulses. So, like I said, the point of the whole vestibular apparatus is to align various head acceleration so that they produce forces in an aligned or a coordinated way so that they act on the hair cells that are all lined up in the same way. For example, in a semicircular canal, the vestibular apparatus aligns head acceleration and all the hair cells are aligned in the same way, they are oriented in the same way, so that the entire semicircular canal apparatus can be diagrammed by just one hair cell. One hair cell, so when we are trying to understand, we don't have to draw the entire one, we can simply have one oriented typical hair cell of that particular semicircular canal lateral be it superior be it uh, posterior they are differently aligned so that we can understand how it is going to behave. This is because all the hair cells are lined up in the same way in the semicircular canal and they all respond to the movement in same way. So now these all the hair cells they are always firing. This spontaneous firing action potential is always happening and then uh, in human beings, mammals, this is supposed to be 80 to 90 uh, spikes and which uh, this 80 to 90 spikes which causes a resting potential of like I said 40 to 60 millivolt and then when uh, this resting here, uh, state of uh, this happens because even at rest some tipplings are open and they allow a continuous passage of potassium into the uh, hair cell and this are then modulated by excitatory and inhibitory inputs. So when the deflection occurs towards the kinocilium that is the preferred direction stimulation there is a de the tipplings open potassium increases causing depolarization and increase of the neurotransmitter common glutamate and aspartate causing increased response and there is an excitation and then the reverse happens when there is the direction of stimulation in the non-preferred side. So even the open tip links get closed and there is hyperpolarization and reduced neurotransmitter reaction. So how does the uh, action potential come to be uh, generated? So these stereocilia and the kinocilia, they have an inherent some amount of stiffness due to presence of actin uh, fibers in them, due to presence of actin. So they are all connected to each other through uh, these protein links which are called tip links because the tip is linking and this tip link is attached to a non-selective uh, cation channel complex allowing 
allowing only passage of cations into the hair cell. So, we know that the endolymph is rich in potassium and when there is a preferred direction of movement, then these tiplings, they stretch and these, they further open and the ions enter the hair cells. Okay. So, the stereocilia and these are all, all various types of protein. In fact, sometimes when absence of these proteins are found in congenital diseases and that can also lead to some amount of disbalance. So, what is happening? So, basically you have a non-selective uh, cation channel complex which when there is a preferred when there is a preferred direction of movement, the potassium and the calcium, it enters the, it opens because of it opens, this op, these tiplings opens. So, this is connected to uh, this channel complex. So, this also opens and the uh, ions, they enter. Why is this opening? Because when we move in a particular way, the endolymph, it moves in a particular way and that we know that the hair cells are embedded in the gelatinous matrix. So, all this is moving and that is causing the opening for whatever reason. How that is moving, we shall come to it later. So, because of this movement of these hair fibers, the potassium enters. When the potassium enters, it allow, causes the vesicular, uh, it helps the um, calcium to uh, fuse with the fuse with the vesicular uh, vesicles which contain the neurotransmitters and then once this fusion happens, there is release from the neurotransmitters and impulse is generated. So, this is happening along the electrochemical gradient and once the potassium finishes with its work, then it is actively pumped out through potassium channels along the uh, elect uh, along the outside the uh, along the electrochemical gradient and when the opposite happens then this channel they close and this gets closed and therefore that releases the calcium presence that releases the vesicle fusion that releases the re sorry that reduces the calcium that reduces the vesicle fusion that reduces the release of the glutamate and aspartate and therefore hyperpolarization occurs so this is how we have understood how the movement of endolymph causes the movement of stereocilia and uh, and uh, an opening of tiplings inter uh, introduction of potassium down the electrochemical gradient along with calcium this potassium then causes the cal helps the calcium to fuse to the vesicle and release of neurotransmitters causing excitatory uh, impulses when the movement is in the preferred direction stimulation and also we have understood how the reverse is happening when the movement is in the non-preferred direction. Certain key points now, we we'll come to the third part of the lecture, certain key points. The vestibular system responds to acceleration when we are increasing or decreasing speed. After a while, when there is constant motion, it is interpreted as rest by the vestibular system because there is no further movement and therefore it helps us to read a book in an aeroplane. When we are flying in the plane, for all practical purposes, we feel as if we are stationary. The difference is gravity. Because gravity force is equal to mass into acceleration. So, gravity is a force which is proportional to acceleration. So, even though we are always standing, there is some amount of excitation and some inhibition all the time happening, which is helping us to understand because gravity is constant, acceleration is happening just with the fact that we are standing. 
Another important fact is that mammalian hair cells, once they are lost, they never cannot regenerate uh, spontaneously. And therefore, once lost, the peripheral vestibular hypofunction is permanent and we can only hope to the central compensation and through vestibular rehabilitation therapy to strengthen the other mechanism. So, this very fact highlights the role of vestibular rehabilitation therapy as well as we should encourage movement and not just drug a patient to sleep and encourage central compensation. Various studies have done but so far we have not been successful in inducing regeneration of these uh, hair cells. So, otolith. Otolith organs which are housed in the uh, vestibule that is the, let me just go back. So, otolith organs are, are the utricle and the saccule as you must already know from your anatomy class and they are, so they are detecting the linear acceleration and gravity. Their sensory epithelium and they are also responsible for maintaining uh, static balance. So, their uh, sensory neuroepithelium is known as the macula and it responds to linear acceleration and gravity. This it does due to the presence of these stone like structures called otoconia or otolith. These are nothing but calcium carbonate crystals and they are embedded in the gelatinous matrix into which the hair cells are projecting. These calcium carbonate crystals are dense and they have a specific gravity of 2.7 gram per ml and the endolymph has a specific gravity of 1 gram per ml. So, these specific gravities are important to understand. So, this macula therefore it naturally functions as a bioaccelerometer and it reacts to the linear acceleration whether it is vertical or whether it is horizontal. So, these can be translation that is fore and aft movement. It can be side to side movement that is seen in utricle or it can be up and down movement like we see going in an elevator or due to gravity which is predominantly done by the saccule. So, predominantly being a key word and this is therefore responsible for maintaining the static balance. This is a close-up figure of the inner ear which we can see that the utricle is contained within a swelling adjacent to the semicircular canals and the saccule is closer to the cochlea and they are surrounded by the dark cells, here they are the dark hair cells which we have already discussed. The linear acceleration they can produce displacement of the otoconia due to the high mass much like rocks rolling down a hill or when the coffee cup falls down the dashboard of a moving car when it suddenly accelerates. This is an extremely oversimplified orientation of the otolith and it means to only give one an orientation uh, about how they are generally placed in the uh, in the inner ear. The utricle is approximately oriented uh, in the horizontal plane. Actually, it is slightly 25 degrees and saccule is uh, seen here. It is seen in the sagittal plane. So, therefore, if there is any horizontal movement, if there is any horizontal movement, the otoconia will sway and it will cause opening a movement and therefore transmit to the hair cell and tiplings and the stereocilia will either move towards the kinocilium or moved away. It will be either the preferred direction. So, it will be either the preferred direction or it will be the not preferred direction. So, opening or closing of the tiplings will happen. So, uh, <clears throat> 
so the utricle responds to the horizontal movement of the head for example when the car is moving and it suddenly comes to a stop and the saccule responds to the gravity like when you are jumping or you are in an elevator this structure the macula has basically another important point as you can see due to the presence of close presence of utricle to the semicircular canals it can lead to the migration easier migration of otoconia into the canals causing the condition known as bppv and here as you can see the saccule is oriented here very close to the oval window so in step in after a stepidotomy so when there is a movement it hits the saccule and the patient sometimes gets the sensation of vertigo the structure of macula has three main components. It has a heavy mass load, which is calcium carbonate crystals or otoconia. These otoconia are roughly about 2,200,000 per macula in mammals. And we are born with the one with which, which is the final amount for throughout our life. They do not regenerate either. They contain various proteins and glycoproteins and glycosaminoglycans, notably the protein otoconin 90, which accounts for 90% of the protein, which is, and they are found in this. Then there is a, this, there is this gel mass. This gel mass is the elastic connection of the matrix of the otolithic membrane to the hair cells and it is divided into two. So, this entire thing is this. It is divided into two. This is also gel and this part is divided into two. This matrix, this matrix is divided into an outer layer of fibrils which support the otoconia and an inner loose columnar meshwork which has elastic properties to distribute the inertial forces. Uh, inertial forces, uh, this is the matrix, inertial forces into the hair cells. Unlike the semicircular canal, the hair cells are not oriented in the same direction and they, as you can see, they face against each other uh, by a centrally uh, located, it's a curvilinear line uh, called striola. The hair cells are located either towards the striola or away from the striola. And it is this arrangement of striola which allows the response of the head in all directions and we shall be seeing that. Due to the top heavy structure of the, the hair cells are sensitive to movement of the otoconia which causes either excitation or inhibition depending on how the hair cells are uh, stimulated. They will, any tilt or gravity will either uh, make the hair cells move in the preferred direction or not in the preferred direction as in back tilt or forward tilt depending on how the hair cells are oriented and that will give us an input about our position of head in the space. So again, here you can see the striola, it is a distinctive hair is the uh, this is a striola and it is a distinctive curved zone which is running throughout the center of the maculae and it is the curved shape in order to maximize the sensitivity of the otolithic organs to linear motion in various trajectories. So the striola divides the macula, each macula into two parts the and the hair cells on each side are uh, look uh, are oriented opposite to the in opposite directions in the saccule they face towards the striola and in the utricle they face away from the striola so when there is due to this different orientation that uh, so when there is a movement 
so towards so here there is a gravity so this is an resting state there is some input happening but when there is a movement due to gravity here there these are getting uh, actively even though we are in a resting state these are getting stimulated because it is in the preferred direction these are getting inhibited stimulatory responses are stronger than the uh, inhibitory response so therefore we understand our position in the space and similar thing when we are in resting state and there is a slight movement we are able to orient ourselves because some are getting in the preferred direction some are in the not preferred direction now this is the uh, orientation of the secular macula and this is the orientation of the utricle macula which is more horizontal and this is more in the sagittal plane due to these different orientation displacement of the otolithic membrane has opposite effects on different hair cells these arrows represent the preferred direction of the stimulation of the various hair cells so some hair cells can be stimulated by a certain uh, force and uh, the uh, their exact same will be a uh, uh, inhibited and we experience a sense of linear force or head tilt and the receptors and the afferent fibers therefore tuned for all motions in the 3d space will then stimulate the brain accordingly the range of orientations of hair bundles within the otolith organs helps them to transmit information about linear forces in every direction in which the <coughs> in which the body moves and the combined output of utricle and saccule will gauge the linear forces acting on the head in, in uh, at any particular time in the three dimensions and they will help us to orient our position now in mammals this triola also corresponds to a polarity reversal line that is which we have already discussed that sometimes these are opposite in polarity and this arrow signify the uh, these arrows signify the preferred direction of movement now due to uh, these different orientations different uh, displacement of the otolithic membrane has opposite effect on the set of on a set of hair cells on each side of the striola so this these two on each side will cause opposite movement up and down these two will cause an opposite movement right and left these two will cause an opposite movement in this direction these two will cause opposite movement in this direction so each 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 preferred direction so we are able to cover this entire 360 degree and it is because the hair cells are differently oriented it is because of the shape of the macula and macula in the utricle and saccule it is because of the differential orientation of of the utricle and saccule that linear motion in all directions we are all directions are coded and the body can respond to it so again i have told that the sac the macula in the utricle are so oriented that uh, they are uh, best responding to any horizontal movement and in the static position they will also tell us about the gravity and that will happen so for example for example if there is any movement uh, so these macula they they will be helpful to generate the compensatory eye movements during any static tilt like this or like this. so this is a horizontal movement this is a horizontal movement like this so what will happen because the specific gravity of otoconia is greater than that of the endolymph any static head tilt suppose towards the right shoulder so towards the right shoulder will cause the otoconia and the stereocilia of the underlying hair cells to bend towards the so this is suppose this is right so 
so suppose this is right so then any movement will cause the stereocilia to bend towards the gynocilia and therefore this will lead to an excitation in the cells which are particularly in that particular orientation and then this will lead to the excitation in the right utricle in the right utricle this right utricle will make uh, connections to the ipsilateral vestibular nucleus on the same side which will then give input to the right superior oblique superior oblique and it will also give inhibitory connections to the same side inferior oblique and then the will be a we will be able to so if my head is straight still my eye is able to maintain the gaze in the correct direction similarly in the uh, we have said that the utricle i told you it lies in the plane of the lateral semicircular canal opening very close to the lateral semicircular canal and utricle opening very close to the lateral semicircular canal and then uh, the sacul it lies in the vertical plane and then when there is a and when there is any movement in up or down in up or down movement there is accordingly up or down movement depending on which hair cells are there so then here you can see if there is upward movement they will get stimulated and accordingly uh, the uh, we shall be able to uh, the when it is going there accordingly the recti muscle will then act and maintain the gaze uh, so if a person is standing upright and is relatively motionless just straight then the saccules are stimulated by acceleration caused by gravity because they are in the vertical plane of the earth same plane as that of the earth but if a person is lying motionless to his or her side is lying motionless to his or her side then the utricles are then stimulated by the gravity and these two are utricle and saccule as you can see they are in uh, opposite direction this is of one ear and this is of the other ear and therefore this fact this arrangement also helps to uh, code for the various movements now we shall be with this we shall finish the basics of the uh, otolith organs and uh, one another important point which i want to mention is that uh, the magnitude of uh, acceleration how much we are moving will depend on how much hair cells are recruited and their firing rate so with this we finish the basics about the otolith organs moving on to the semicircular canals that are responsible for maintaining dynamic equilibrium there are certain key points that we need to understand certain key points that we need to understand that is the sensation of angular motion is due to movement of endolymph in the semicircular canals and this movement is in three positions the pitch is the uh, is along the 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 pitch is along the y-axis that is we fall forward and backward the roll is along the nasal occipital where we go side to side and the yaw is this is the roll and the yaw is um, uh, this is the this is the yaw movement which is along the 
z axis and this is the pitch movement and that is the roll movement the role mm -hmm. of the semi vestibular system is to that the role here means function mm -hmm. the function of the vestibular system is to deliver information about this angular acceleration to the hair cell so that an impulse can be generated these terms have been taken from the aeroplane industry regarding the roll pitch and yaw and they roughly correspond not exactly because the semicircular canal also are not exactly in orientation to the x, y, z planes, but roughly correspond to the three semicircular canals. So, we can see that when we deal with a, this movement, this movement is side to side. Yes, so this is a roll movement and it is due to the stimulation mostly of the anterior and little bit of the posterior. This is the pitch movement which is mostly due to the posterior, less due to the anterior and then uh, this is the yaw movement which is mostly due to the the lateral semicircular canal, there is maximum sensitivity and here the hair cells are not in the same orientation. So, they will have no response because this will be the preferred direction of movement. But in our real life, are we making pure movements of purely pitch, yaw or roll? or there is some other movement also attached. But to understand, we need to consider each movement individually. To understand, we need to believe that the yaw movement is purely caused by the horizontal canal and the pitch movement is mostly caused by the posterior. The roll movement is mostly caused by the anterior. But because our movements are complex, there are always other vectors in play, which if we have time, we shall discuss today. So here is the ampulla and we already know that one end of the uh, semicircular canal is dilated to form the ampulla and the sensory neuroepithelium or the crista ampullaris is present as a complete septum which is completely dividing the endolymph of each side and it extends perpendicularly. Unlike otolith, there is no striola seen. All the hair cells are oriented in one direction and for that particular semicircular canal and they are embedded in a gelatinous matrix gelatinous matrix uh, creating a complete seal type 1 hair cells are more commonly seen in the crest and type 2 are more commonly seen on the slopes generation of action potential is similar but it occurs here due to mechanical displacement of the Cupula. It occurs due to the mechanical displacement of the cupula and uh, which causes the tip links which are embedded in the stereocilia to open or close changing their uh, resting fire rate. So, this is we are considering a yaw movement where there is so when there is the head turning the bony labyrinth moves along but the endolymph is in a fluid and it remains stationary it doesn't move so quickly so it moves in the opposite direction when it moves in the opposite direction then that causes the pushing into the uh, it pushes the uh, uh, the uh, the cupula and therefore the hair cells and depending on the orientation of the hair cells it is either stimulated or it is uh, inhibited. So this causes a drag on the cupula, the cupula bends which leads to a change of impulses. Following acceleration the cupula returns to its original position. So, here it is normal and then when the head turns there is a drag due to inertia and there is an impulse generation depending on the orientation of the hair cells for that particular movement. Now, when how, how quickly it returns? It is calculated by Goldberg to roughly 6 to 7 seconds. Cupula returns to almost 63% of its original resting position. Uh, 
so in lateral uh, canals the cupula are oriented so that when the endolymph uh, if the head the endolymph will move it will cause a stimulation so if there is a head movement the endolymph will move this way if there is a head movement this way endolymph will move this way and it will cause a stimulation and the reverse is true for the vertical canals in the vertical canals just the opposite is there that means in the horizontal canal the hair cells are oriented in such a way that any movement towards the ampulla will stimulate any movement towards the ampulla will stimulate mm -hmm. and in the vertical canal any movement away from the ampulla will stimulate towards will not stimulate and this forms the basis of evolves law the semicircular canals they work in so this is the semicircular canals they work in pairs and these pairs are functional and they can be easily memorized by this mnemonic so this horizontal canal stimulation on one side will cause corresponding inhibition of the other side and we shall come to know that in which direction we are moving for the posterior semicircular canal it is for the anterior of the opposite side for this side it is this side so left anterior right posterior and right anterior left posterior they are parallel and they work in tandem to help us orient in the space each canal lies close to the space they are nearly orthogonal nearly being the key point and uh, these two horizontal canals are nearly parallel So each of these canals are termed functional because when one canal's neural activity increases, the functional pair will decrease its activity. So coming back to the yaw movement, if there is no head movement, both are working. But in case there is a head turn to one side, the in the horizontal, the, uh, the fluid will move towards the ampulla, which will lead to increased activity. So, what is happening on the other side? The fluid is moving away from the ampulla, which will lead to decrease, and the eyes will accordingly remain stable. And we shall know that our head is turning towards one side, and accordingly, there will be hyper or depolarization so this side will depolarize this side will hyperpolarize as you can see by the orientation of the this thing again the responses are further skewed in favor of excitatory response or so two stimuli do not cancel out so there are certain exceptions to this rule for example i have told you the specific gravity of everything the endolymph the cupola everything so if there is a lot of one person drinks a lot of alcohol so then the specific gravity changes and despite no movement one feels the uh, uh, movement of uh, the spinning sensation so another uh, exception to this rule is when autoconial uh, debris enter so we know so uh, so we know that only one side is stimulated and the opposite complementary side is not stimulated so we know we are dealing with pathology so complementary or functional pairs one stimulated the other always not stimulated so in alcohol if both are stimulated you know you are dealing with alcohol or some poisoning if isolated one is stimulated you know you are dealing with some sort of a positional paroxysmal vertigo because now gravity is acting as a stimulator where it should not in the vertical canals opposite will happen so ampullophagal being excitatory like i said it will form the basis of the second and third best uh, evolved loss the vector movement so now this is something very important to understand this is how our horizontal semicircular canals are placed this is anterior this is posterior so if we consider the right hand thumb rule if this is the thing and our we place our hand accordingly so if this is the way our semicircular canal is located this is the vector of the movement if this is the way this is the way this is the vector of the movement for anterior 
this is the axis plane of the movement and this is the vector so we can never have one isolated movement it is always a combination when we go forward we are one is pitching so this so this is pitching forward and the other is pitching so we are having right anterior left posterior it is a combination movement again roll is a combination movement when we are turning like this and just quickly turning then both the otolith organs and the semicircular canal movements are working so this you can see if we are pitching forward it causes the left posterior canal to turn and the left anterior so it causes a pitching forward movement so here you can see roll roll is equal part movements of the right anterior semicircular canal right anterior semicircular canal and the uh, movement of the uh, backward movement in the left anterior canal or the right posterior canal so accordingly functional pairs are interacting so natural head movements typically involve linear as well as angular acceleration the last key point which i want to tell you is that the vestibular system is a slave to the motor system that means all our inputs are basically from the vestibular nuclei are not coming back to the vestibular system primarily they are going further on to the motor system so that our eye our sense of balance can be retained and these are through multisynaptic pathways polysynaptic or disynaptic pathways one such is a vestibular ocular reflex which which helps us to maintain our stabilized gaze in response to the head position and it evolved due to the fact that we initially evolved as hunters so we could act in various positions another important uh, ocular reflex which is there is the vestibular spinal and the vestibular colic reflex now i am not going to reduce the sound of this song because it is very popular these days but as you can see he is able to stabilize his head movement even after placing something so paraspinal muscles are are acting even though he is rotating he is able to stabilize his head movement so because the output is going from the vestibular nuclei to the neck muscles and they are maintaining and the paraspinal muscles the spinal muscles and this is responsible vestibular colic and vestibular spinal uh, reflex which is responsible for maintenance of gaze posture and equilibrium in movement train scenes have been exploited by all movies but particularly by the hindi movies but with respect to vestibular system there are certain very interesting points for example when the train is moving at the constant speed there is no stimulation of the vestibular system i have already explained to you that's why we are able to read so how does the brain know whether we are moving or we are stationary secondly why do we get confused when two trains cross each other how does the brain know that if the other train is moving or the one in which we are there or if we are standing on the platform or we are standing on the train and there's a how do we know which is moving in relative to the other lastly how does the head differentiate versus a translation movement because this is also going to stimulate the same Uh, horizontal movements it's also going to stimulate the utricle versus a head tilt which is also going to stimulate so these reflexes and these uh, answers should be answered in the next class hopefully all of you will tune in for that these are important explanatory videos as well as articles which will be helpful and i recommend reading them thank you so much